Section 12, Chapters 42 through 46. In this section, Klee and I expand and discuss different things that creatives may chase in order to quote unquote break in to the art world and how that can hinder you. We also talk about titles and scams. We dive deep into the mainstream art world and the world of gatekeepers. We talk about the art stock market, diamonds, and money. We also talk about the futile attempt to find the X to get into the art world and bowel movements. We then go on to discuss how to get noticed and why it's so important to just put yourself out there in the world. What are you chasing anyway? (laughs) I like this section of the book uh, because it deals with some of the stuff that we might not want to admit to ourselves that we're seeking or chasing or after, either in life or in an art career. A lot of times people get into... Uh, doing something and because their motivations behind it uh, are not really genuine Mm -hmm. you know like maybe they're seeking validation or they're seeking money or they're seeking whatever it is fame glory riches yeah exactly any of those things what ends up happening is uh, when you don't get it right away it could be extremely discouraging and that's the number one reason in my life that I've given up is because Things that didn't work out for those underlying things that I didn't even realize that that's what I was looking for. Absolutely. So chasing stuff is not a good long-term motivator, and it's also an emotional roller coaster. About 15 years ago, one of my friends who thought a lot about stuff asked me, "What's if you could name one thing that you're guilty of wanting that you probably shouldn't want or don't want to want but you do want it anyway like what's your admission what's the thing that you're after and my answer was acknowledgement right and looking back i realized that that pursuit of acknowledgement caused me so much heartache in so many different creative endeavors and life endeavors because when the acknowledgement wasn't there or when it wasn't there in the way that i deep down felt like it should be there i felt less than For that lack of acknowledgement. But what makes this really, really powerful is realizing that a lot of artists, whether you're a musician, uh, a painter, a jeweler, any kind of creative craft, and you start putting yourself out there, one of the main things that gives the art world a lot of power is that we're constantly searching for some kind of validation. And for a lot of us, uh, we don't get that validation from our parents. So, you know, we want that acknowledgement. We want validation. We want people to take us seriously in what we do. And sometimes we don't even realize that that's what we're chasing. And it is a roller coaster because you get pulled in so many different directions. Uh, Instead of dealing with the simplicity of why it is that you do, you know, I'm an artist. Uh, I love to paint. And that's why I create art. Uh, it, it, when you don't realize that you're chasing validation or whatever it is that you're chasing, you could easily uh, change those words to I'm an artist and I paint because I want people to take me seriously as an artist or I'm an artist and I paint because I want to make money, mm-hmm. uh, it, which is hilarious because that's almost like an oxymoron. And that's where you get uh, global, internationally acclaimed, award-winning contemporary artist uh, Rafi Perez. Yes. I watched that title take form over the span of time that it did. And in the beginning, I was like, oh, so fancy. And then I was like, I should probably be doing the same thing. I don't have any awards, i.e. no acknowledgments, but I am internationally selling contemporary jewelry artist Clee And yeah. I was like, oh, that's uncomfortable for me. And really, in your realization, like, simple is better. What was really fascinating about that whole process was that towards the beginning, it was almost like I had a corporate mentality, right? Because you see, like, award-winning chef and... Uh, oh, Michelin oh, yeah, chef. Yeah, exactly. Award-winning pest control. Uh, award-winning beauty salon. Like, the, a lot of people, a lot of businesses and stuff love putting the accolades in front of what they do because it gives other people the impression that uh, they are a step above someone else. Mm-hmm. And it's hilarious because I was voted best of the coast. 
I've won several awards for uh, specific pieces of art. I wasn't creating because those are the things that I wanted. The problem was that when I started, that was part of the validation. I wanted to be an award-winning artist. So the moment I won some lousy award uh, at some little podunk uh, show, all of a sudden, I'm an award-winning artist. Did your daily life change much? No, not at all. And what's interesting about that is that once the reality of that situation hit me, I started to look at other award-winning so-and-sos in a different light because I realized, like, if you go and you do an art show and that particular judge that is judging the art show really, really connects with your piece, then you win an award. Does it mean that it's better than the rest of the art that's out there? No. No. It Especially just, where art is concerned, because it is so subjective. Yeah, it just means that like you happen to win an award because you put yourself out there more times than not, and that's that's what I I am proud of the fact that I was willing to put myself out there and get rejected over and over and over and over, which is one of the reasons that I have as many awards as I do because you know one out of a hundred I'm gonna have to win something, but is it something that really sets me apart? from any other artist? No, not at all. I want to make something clear here, though. I don't personally think there's anything wrong with excelling at your craft or your art form so much so that you get awards. Like, if you are a badass chef and you have awards, that is awesome. If you are a top-notch actor or uh, or a visionary artist and you have awards. Like I think that's awesome. I, do I think too. it's the simple it's the kind of sort of empty pursuit of the award yeah, that would be the and, problem. And that's what I mean. If you are uh simply doing something because because that's part of it, validation, uh award winning, uh that's part of it. There's nothing wrong with wanting to win an award. But if you think that your life is going to change because you won an award, um, that that's just not going to be the case. And it's the pursuit of those things that can put you on that emotional roller coaster and make you an easy target for the scammers and the predators of the art world, which you mentioned. And they they are getting sneakier and sneakier oh, yeah. as the years go by. And the, the latest trend that I've been noticing is um, these influencer emails. Oh, yeah. Um, and they fluff your feathers by saying, we're looking for influencers like you to represent such and such thing. And we'll send you this travel mug and you can talk about it and blah, blah, blah. And they basically approach you as if you are globally famous. Right. Which sets you up for... You're going to do advertising for us and we're not going to pay you. (laughs) I read a comment on Twitter where one of those people that considered themselves an influencer, like they had like 2,000 subscribers on one channel and like 200 subscribers on another channel. And they approached somebody and said, you know, this would really benefit you if you created this and this type of art for me, for my channel, like he wanted something specific and this will benefit you because I have 2000 subscribers on this channel and I've got 300 subscribers on Twitter or on Instagram and you've only got a hundred people following you. Mm. And so like, this is a great opportunity for you. You're not going to get paid. And, uh, you know, my standards are high and it was just like a total like jerk email. Yeah. The whole influencer culture is like so full of fluff and it, accolades. It is and- so, it is so hilarious. It's kind of like the thing that we watched about that. There's a restaurant in Belgium. I'm pretty sure it's in Belgium where they get contacted by influencers all the time and say, you know, I want to eat there. Would you comp the meal? And basically for the last 10 years, they have responded with an email saying, uh, you know what, we're not willing to comp your meal, but if you come in and eat, uh, we will give two servings to the homeless, uh, a free meal to the homeless. Mm -hmm. And in 10 years that they've done that and been contacted hundreds of times, not once has an influencer taken them up on that. Yeah, which is really interesting. And and that really, really bothers me. So like a lot of these things that target like artists or influencers or anything like that, they're all the same thing. It's like, first off, when somebody targets me, I'm like, "Uh, did you even look at my website? Did you even watch our videos? Did you even check out my artwork? Right. Like, do you even know who I am? Do you even know who I am? <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know how many times uh, I've gotten those emails to say you've been selected for Artist of the Year, mm-hmm. right? And like, I look at it and I'm like, this is a total scam. Like, they want you to to 
basically purchase their book for $130 and then in that book it's going to say that you are an award winning artist and they even send you like a little plaque or something like that. And I'm like, that is such complete and utter bullshit. Yeah, it should and be it, a plaque that says you paid a percentage of the publishing fees for this book. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah, it's a lot of there's a lot of scams out there that either prey on your insecurity or they prey on your ego, which you know could also be false insecurity. You're a movie famoso. Please yeah. represent us. Yeah, and and it works both ways because uh, a lot of times uh, the other people that artists have to worry about are other artists that are putting out courses. It's one of the reasons that you and I are so careful about the information that we put out there because. I've seen other artists that started their career, maybe hit a little bit of success, and then put a pause to their art career so they could start a, a mentoring and coaching thing. Yeah. And essentially become mentors and coaches instead of actually artists. Right. The art gets uh, pushed to the back burner. Yeah, exactly. And so, like, those are those are on par with those influencers out there to me that are like, you know, I would come and eat at your restaurant because I'm an important person. Or someone fluffing your feathers and saying like, hey, you know what? You could pay me for this award because we think that you're an important person. And it's like you really, really got to check your ego and make sure that you don't fall for the crap that people are approaching you with and that you don't become a big a-hole and think that you, you know, your, your crap doesn't stink. Right. And so it's not just all predators out there to get you. There's wonderful things that can happen in an art career and if you've gained awards fame financial success notoriety accolades then chances are they were well deserved yeah uh, but if you're out there in pursuit of those things for the wrong reasons uh it's it's not sustainable and it's not a fulfilling career yeah, yeah it's a roller coaster of a career which brings us to the gatekeepers and the middlemen which is a section that begins to delve into the mainstream art world and attempt to explain, demystify, at least shed some light on what in the world is going on there. And it's not that all of the people in the mainstream art world or all the gatekeepers or all the middlemen are bad people. There are some really good people out there trying to promote art and artists and good things. But then you have this whole other aspect of it that is not only confusing, but like just completely overwhelming. It seems like this impenetrable fortress of an art world. And I don't think very many people understand much about it at all. So one of the things you mentioned there uh, about good people being in the art world, there is a lot of good people in the art world, uh, but there's also a lot of charlatans. There's a lot of people that um, promote the obscurity and the confusion that happens in the mainstream art world because it benefits and lines their pockets the more confused not only artists are but the general public when it comes to pricing art or the legitimacy of art or what is real art and what is not real art right it's as you put it uh once you're in you're in but what exactly are you in it's a lot of smoke and mirrors it's a lot of grandiose illusionary things it's sort of a dog and pony show if you will and uh it's set up that way uh because it works yeah it, the yeah. less you understand about it the more uh you know experts can tell you this is the way it is it it is a business model that doesn't only work in the art world the art market is one of the markets that is like that but basically any market that you get into you're going to run into people that are in it for the money mm -hmm. and you're going to run into people that are in it for the passion of doing it and unfortunately a lot of times you hear of bad business deals occurring just being the norm in the music industry, the movie industry, a lot of creative fields have this uh, this obscurity, these gatekeepers, people that you have to impress in order to get to the next level. Yeah, and they use fancy lingo, and the next thing you know, you've accidentally signed away the rights to your art, and a lot of times these middlemen, these reps, these agents, these managers 
are making more money off of your art than you are. Yeah. Um, so the thing that's most infuriating, I think, about the mainstream art world is that it can be predatory. Yes. And you have these artists that are clamoring to get a piece of that, and it's easy to take advantage of those people. And it's also a little infuriating to me that the mainstream art market is the authority, if you will, right. and I'm using air quotes here, on what is real art and what is fake art, what is important art and what is unimportant art, what is luxury art and what is knockoff brand art, if you will. And you mentioned De Beers. Everyone knows De Beers, diamonds, right? right? right. And it's really a lot like that. De Beers created basically a perfect system for making diamonds a highly valued commodity. Right. Which was, uh, it's it's outlined. Uh, you create a demand, right? Which was a marketing campaign. Diamonds are forever. Right. Right? You set the rules by which you determine which of this product is valuable and how do we value this product, which is their four C's. Right. Color cut, clarity, and carrot, right? Uh, you control the market. So basically, they owned the lion's share of diamond mining operations and available diamonds. Exactly. Then they limited the availability that was available to the public. So basically you had, it was revealed, they were sitting on essentially stockpiles of diamonds and only releasing this little quantity at a time to, to create ma- to a false it, demand. Yeah, to make it seem like there was a shortage. Yeah, so. and there's a name for that. It's called the scarcity principle. Yep. The more you limit availability, the higher you can mark it up and the more people want it. And then you just inflate prices and yep. you continue to do so. And then the system self-perpetuates. It self-perpetuates because nowadays a lot of people will quote, diamonds are forever, diamonds are very rare, diamonds are expensive. And it is based on the ideas and the thoughts that came before that were created from a really well put together marketing campaign that eventually became true because it's been going on for years. Absolutely. Now, diamonds are awesome, as I think all mineral specimens are awesome. Right. Um, Can you put a monetary value on something awesome like that? I don't know. De Beers did it. Kudos to them for coming up with a brilliant system. The art market essentially does the same thing with the high-dollar art. This art is important, right? We have possession of the lion's share of it. This is why this art is important, which, by the way, those rules are constantly changing. Right. There's a limited number of works, and there's limited access, and it sells for this much on average, and you can't just buy a painting from Christie's if you're just an average guy or gal, right? So limiting availability, making it exclusive, and then that demand and pricing just goes up and up and up right and it's kind of like uh it happens in the luxury goods market too i it mean happens. it's yeah it's identical they're called veblen goods and i remember seeing this on a documentary and being like oh there's a name for that and it's any type of luxury good for which the demand increases as the price increases which is the opposite of how demand usually works yeah. right it's, a, it's hilarious because a lot of artists contact us and are like, I need to lower my prices. And I'm like, mm, no, no. Nope. So, so usually as the demand for something increases, prices organically increase. Right. This is the opposite of that. You come in hot with your pricing, right? You make a name for your brand and people want it simply because not everyone can afford it. Exactly. Luxury cars, luxury handbags, things of that nature. Veblen goods. I was like, this is such an interesting phenomenon. But basically, you have the same thing going on with art. What a lot of people see as the art world is kind of like De Beers, uh, putting out all this propaganda about diamonds and, and stuff like that. So like over the years... This, uh, this whole thing is propagated and has become this self-sustaining rumor that has somehow become true, that people believe is absolutely true. So uh, that the art market is very limited. There aren't really that many artists out there. There is only a small collection of, of worthwhile art. Like all of these things are absolute and complete bullshit. Mm-hmm. The problem is that for a young artist that wants to get started... 
and you know they're looking at these art fairs that are going around in their town and they're going out there and they're putting their stuff out there it's almost like you feel like you have not reached success because in your mind you think that success means i got into the mainstream art world and this big gallery this mega gallery now has me i'm one of their their artists and i'm making millions of dollars on my art and it's just it is a completely controlled market where the artist rarely makes the millions of dollars and usually someone else needs to be making a hell of a lot more millions for the artist to even begin to start making millions of dollars. Absolutely. And it's really only in very recent times that people are starting to go, wait a second. Yeah. Whether you're talking about diamonds, and I see more and more people looking for alternative center stones for engagement rings, questioning ethical practices, and don't even get me started on ethical practices in the diamond world or the art world. There's a lot of underhanded stuff that's been going on for a long time. Now people are starting to go, hold on, A, this is unscrupulous, and B, we could just go around you. Right. At this point. Well, it's and it's it because it's unregulated. It's been unregulated for a long, long time. And because it's unregulated, nobody knows what is actually going on. You're just basically it's the the entire mainstream art world is dependent on the rumors and the way that business has been done in the past. Mm-hmm. And it is unscrupulous. A lot of these big high ticket items that people are looking at and they're saying like, oh, wow, I want to I want to sell a million dollar painting at, at Christie's. What they don't understand is that the people that are trading those paintings back and forth, they're in it for the money. It's a commodity. It, it's not even about the art anymore. Oh, definitely. That's why we call it me and you the art stock market. Yeah. Half the time, probably more than half the time, the people purchasing the art never even look at it. It immediately goes from auction into storage, climate-controlled storage, for later trading. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it's hilarious because if you watch one of those auctions on Christie's, right, they got the people on the side there with their phones and they're, like, lifting their hands. Yeah. And if you ever look at the stock market, the way that the, the people that work at the stock market are doing their deals, they're lifting their hands and they're doing whatever, and some of them are on the phone and they're talking to this person and that person, it basically, it, it's it's very similar to oh, that. yeah. It's just a little bit more laid back than when you're looking at these crazy people running around the stock market. But it's it's the same thing they're doing. It's a commodities market. They're buying something, holding on to it, letting the price price raise, because now, like, let's say you're famous. Now the piece has provenance, which is going to add to the price. Right. Absolutely. And it could be like um, immediately a painting gains provenance and it doubles in price. Yeah, I, I think it's hilarious. The example in the book about Daniel Radcliffe wanting to purchase a work of art and being told, I'm sorry, we're holding out for someone who has a little more um, fame. Yeah, a little bit more fame because that way the provenance of the piece immediately, the moment that the person buys it goes up and they were like, no, Daniel Radcliffe is not good enough He's for that. not our guy. Now, what you don't mention in the book, which I think is amazing and hilarious, is that the artist of the work heard about that. Yep. And the artist himself was a huge Harry Potter fan and ended up reaching out to Daniel Radcliffe and I imagine creating a piece for him. Oh, yeah. A lot of the middlemen, a lot of the galleries, a lot of stuff like that, they are just in it for the money. Absolutely. Commodity trading. And that's what gets all the media attention. But there's this whole other world out there of artists and art collectors, people who don't even know yet that they're art collectors, relationships. And personal value, emotional value, as opposed to market value. Yeah, exactly. The whole other world of the art market, like the one that that we live in and that most artists live in, takes up about 99.9% of the art market. It's that that 0.1% that gets a lot of the media and a lot of the news that has to do with like museums and what big time millionaire collectors and billionaire collectors are are selling and what Christie's is selling and a lot of that stuff is what gets into the media but it's like the local newspapers that talk about the local artist and and what they're doing and and things like that 
that don't make national news because you're not dealing with this painting sold for a hundred million dollars. And everyone's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, okay, cool. Let them do what they do. Yeah. They're, that's a system that, you know, like if you're in it, then cool. Collect your paintings or broker your paintings or whatever. Trade up your paintings. Um, but the idea that you can't be successful or you can't have a fulfilling art career unless you are in that world or that your art doesn't matter or that you don't matter, that's that's where I'm like, wait a second. You can have a totally fulfilling life and successful art career and never even uh, never even approach that world. Yeah, and it, it's the reason that I talk about the art. I, I don't think that there's anything wrong with the mainstream art world. That's just a, a one segment of the art world, right? And mm -hmm. whether or not somebody wants to be in that, uh, it, it doesn't matter to me. The reason that I put this section in the book was because a lot of artists think that that's it. That's the only... Uh, way that they could show their art and it and is, have it matter yeah exactly and it is very 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 exclusive and very very limited and you have to jump through hoops in order to get in there and it's got to be all about who you know and it's got to be all about uh where you are it's very very discouraging because in that world where you do have to jump through hoops and you do have to do what someone else wants you to do um it, it's next to impossible to get in it's like it's like gambling basically like yeah. maybe you'll get lucky maybe you won't Whereas I would rather promote just blazing your own trail and you don't have to rely on luck. Yeah, absolutely. I, I will say and I will continue to say the same thing that I say about the music industry and record labels. The best time in your career to get approached by a record label is when you don't need them. Exactly. Because you've already done it. Yeah. Um, because then you hold the cards. So then whatever choice you make at that point, cool. Because you don't need them. Listen, just go out there, blaze your trail, make your art career happen as much as you possibly can. Have as much fun as you can doing it. Uh, go out there and promote yourself and then be patient. Wait, you know, maybe it'll take a year, two years, three years, ten years for you to, to be able to start making it as a living. But if your goal is to sell your stuff at Christie's, in 10 years, that's a completely different path. And that is a path that like you have to determine what it is that you want to do and why it is that you want to sell your pieces at Christie's. I think the why, yeah. Like if you want that, go for it most certainly, but but definitely have the why uh, question. And uh, why, do, why is that the end goal? Again, that goes back to what are you chasing anyway? Are you chasing the accolades? Do you want to just be able to tell somebody that you sold a piece at Christie's? Get off my case, mom. Yeah, I sold a piece at Christie's. Exactly. There's nothing <laughs> wrong with that. It's, it's like my cousin. My cousin's goal when I'd ask him, what do you want to do? He's like, I want to sell a million dollars. I'm like, okay, well, that's that's all fine and dandy. I get that. I do. Who wouldn't? Mm -hmm. But uh, what do you what do you want to sell for a million dollars? What Why? Do you want to make a million dollars? And he was like, I don't know, just anything. I don't even care what it is. I yeah, just. Yeah, I don't even care what it is. And, you know, that way, that way my dad will get off my case. And I'm like, really? You have to sell a million dollars for your dad to get off your case? Why don't you just tell your dad to get off your case now? And then you could go out and do whatever it is that you want to do and not wait until you make a million dollars to tell your dad to get off your case. Absolutely. And unfortunately, money represents uh, oftentimes what we actually want that we don't realize that we want uh, and we substitute in money as if it's that. Uh, and the next section in the book is about money. Yeah. So let's talk about money, baby. <laughs> Okay, raise your hand if you grew up around people who had a crappy money mentality. Yep. <laughs> and in, in case you 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 know you guys can't see that, so that's both of us raising our hand. Yeah. Okay. Hands down, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then later on, found that oh shucks, you've also adopted the crappy money mentality. Money is a stressor. You want it. There's never enough of it. You feel guilty about wanting it. You don't know how to get more of it. 
you don't want to have too much of it because you don't feel like you have a business mind to manage all of it. You get some and you're scared of losing it. Yep. The story goes on and on, and that's why it's going to be a book in of itself, I think. It is. I wanted to write about money in this book, and as I was writing the chapter, I realized that like there is so much uh, going on with money mentality that there is no way... I mean, this this book is already 270 pages long. That was after I cut out 60 pages of right. stuff that I had written. And uh, I realized, like, man, I'm going to touch on this subject in the most powerful way that I can. But, like, this is not the end-all, be-all when it comes to money. This is just uh, almost like a starter guide. Your money mentality really, really matters when you are deciding to do something as obscure and that already has the stigma of being an artist Mm -hmm. because if you have a poor money mentality going into this then basically you're dragging that money mentality into a field that's already a, a little bit of a challenge absolutely and that goes for whether you're scared to make money you're guilty about wanting money or you're only pursuing money in the example of your cousin yeah um Money sucks as a motivator. It won't get you through the hard times. And chasing solely money is uh, is a huge stressor. Yeah. Uh, when you don't have it, you're freaking out because you don't have it. When you do have it, you're freaking out because you want to hang on to it. Like, it's just this Ouroboros of bullshit, basically. It's, it's funny because you just said, like, money is not a good motivator. And I remember growing up and hearing money is a good motivator. And it wasn't until, like, I really started thinking about it and, like, looking at the pattern. Doing anything, like, if you're doing marketing, if you decide that you're going to do marketing and you start marketing and you realize that, like, things are not, you're not really selling that much Uh, It's easy for you to get discouraged because if money is what's motivating you and keeps you motivated to keep going, then uh, there's just not going to be enough money in the beginning. And a lot of people that get started in an art career um, don't realize that you got to you got to go through the suck. There's going to be a lot of dry periods, especially in the beginning. And you got to be patient because you really don't know how long it's going to take for things to really pick up. Even Absolutely. starting even starting any business that already exists where there's a business model, you still have to wait a minimum of three years before your business takes off. In most cases, yeah. And, and 10 years into this art career thing, we've had really slow periods with money. We've had some times that we're like, holy crap, this is pretty freaky. Yeah. Uh, money's pretty scarce right now. And if money had been the motivator then the ability to just shift focus and refocus on what we were doing here as creatives in the studio would have been out the window. Oh, yeah. It would have been this scramble to try to figure out a way to make money, which if anyone's ever tried to do the scramble to figure out how to make money quickly, it usually doesn't work out so well. Well, the thing is that when when money is your motivator, what ends up happening is that when you don't have enough money, you become desperate. Right. And when you become desperate, uh, you you become dumb. You're just dumb. You don't you don't make good decisions when you're desperate. Right. Which we covered in the whole f- fight or flight section. Yeah. Exactly. Now I was a pretty poor kid. We didn't have money. Uh, there was everything was in financial terms, like everything. Um, So I grew up learning, you know, like you don't waste money and you don't spend money on frivolous things. And well, I decided to pursue a whole career (laughs) in creating what some would consider frivolous goods, right? I don't consider them to be frivolous goods. Um, But, you know, uh, don't ever ask for money, money this, money that. And so I definitely found myself wanting money, like, because what I really wanted was to get out of that vicious cycle. Yeah. What I really wanted was peace of mind. What I really wanted was to feel personal freedom, that I could do the things that I want to do with my life. But what I've realized is that I use money to represent those things, but that's an inside job. Because you could have $100,000 and feel completely in bondage, no peace of mind, and still be trapped in the vicious cycle. Or you could have $10... And have complete peace of mind knowing that you have full capability to do what you want with your life. One of the main reasons, if you ask somebody, like, why do you want to have a lot of money? 
Like, let's say that somebody's like, I want to have 50000 in the bank or I want to have 100000 in the bank or whatever amount it is that they, they claim, right? And you ask them, well, why do you want that money in the bank? And they'll say, because I don't want to worry. Right. Right? And that way I don't have to worry about my bills and I don't have to worry about this and I don't have to worry about that. And what's interesting about that statement is that uh, worry is not something that you get. You know what I mean? It's like something you do. Worry is something that you do. So like if you don't want to worry and you want to stop that pattern, then stop worrying. Right. About it. Because like whether or not you have the money or you don't have the money, um, it's going to work out either way. And worrying is... Zero percent of the time going to fix the problem. It is. A com- I've learned it is a complete waste of time. Worrying about anything is an absolute and complete waste of time. So there are some ways that you've learned over the years and I've learned over the years to obviously understand money, understand your money as a business person and a creative. Right. Um, bring in some money. <laughs> And also put some money back into the cash flow stream that's coming out. Um, And so there are things that, like we've set in place, and you kind of outline those in the book, so we won't go over them. But the whole idea is to understand your money and develop a good relationship with your money so that you don't have to focus on your money. So understanding your motivations, shifting your focus, changing your relationship with money, setting up systems like the one you describe in the book where you know what's coming out and what's going in, right? right? Uh, Having sales goals, but uh, like as we covered, I think in a recent podcast, you can't make people buy your art. Right. Right. All you can do is provide as many opportunities for people to encounter your art as possible. So even then, you're not talking about money. You're talking about putting yourself out there. Right. And and that's why like money should not be the goal. It is the action of the potentiality that might make you some money. That should be the goal. And that's I think it's one of the most difficult things for people to do, because a, a lot of us grow up just completely and utterly focused on money or the lack thereof. And so like a lot of our business decisions, a lot of things that that we uh, would do when it comes to business could easily be motivated by money. I'm going to make this much money or I'm going to make that much money. And really all that is is math and a side effect to what it is that you did. And so the goal should be more about the action of like, I want to put myself out there. I want to create this many pieces by the end of the year and I want to put them in this many places and and giving yourself the steps in order to get there and understand that when it comes to the money, that's that's a trickle. It's little by little here and there and multiple streams of income and whatever it is that you can formulate in order to have that stream come in. But don't expect a, a freaking Niagara Falls from the beginning. <laughs> a deluge of cash yeah, money. Yeah, and especially if it is not Niagara Falls, don't be disappointed by your efforts because that's where chasing after money becomes an issue. Right, and you mentioned multiple streams of income, and I wanted to touch on that because, you know, you hear everyone, and we talk about multiple streams of income. Everyone talks about multiple streams of income, yeah. and people are like, what is that? How do I do that? What kinds of, I need some ideas, and are they going to work, and is it going to mean that I could pay my bills this month? And I just kind of wanted to touch on that and say, like, we've tried things slowly over time, and often they were just, like, harebrained ideas Um, but the point of the multiple streams of income also in of themselves they weren't just for revenue no and like some of them were slow to start some of them failed miserably uh some of them took off and some of them took a long time to do whatever but the main thing was uh as a motivator the multiple streams of income for me is like pursuing what might be a harebrained idea also for the sake of like keeping inspiration going. I'm going to put jingles out there, not because I think that they're going to buy me a house someday, but because music is something I love to do and I'm actually kind of scared to do the jingles thing. And that's the thing. You never know. There's an artist out there that is on YouTube and he was writing about multiple streams of income and trying different things and how he had tried this one thing for a year and it was very clear that his motivation was to make more money, right? It wasn't like a passion project. And so 
a, a good example of somebody failing at something is because they're chasing money. They tried it for a year. After a year, their income was less than what they were hoping for. And so they saw it as a failure and they stopped that creative endeavor. Mm -hmm. Right now, our mission has not been to make money the motivator. Our mission has been to make the creative project the motivator and see. And what happens there is like if we start releasing uh, the the music because you enjoy doing the music and if you're going to create something, why not put it out there for sale? Absolutely. It'd be, it'd be stupid. Like a lot of people are like, yeah, but this is just a, 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 a hobby. That's fine. As long as you don't get money wrapped up into that hobby as the motivator, but the hobby itself and the potentiality to make money with that hobby, then absolutely put it out there. Because a lot of people will tell you, don't try to make money off of your hobbies because then you turn it into a business. That's something that I talk about in the book of like keeping an eye on yourself and making sure that you don't get stressed out by the things that you're supposed to love. And really when it comes down to it, the more you put stuff out there that there is the potential that it is going to sell, but you're putting it out there because you love putting it out there, that's where you'll keep going past the year mark. When I look at that story, like obviously for a lot of people that makes sense, like he quit after a year, chalk that up as a failure. That's fine. But to me, I was like, you just, it just started taking off. Mm -hmm. It just started to grow legs. You just started to figure out what it was that you wanted to do with this. The only problem was that you were doing it only for the money. You were not doing it because it was a passion project. Absolutely. So like YouTube and music for us um, lost us money. Oh, yeah. For years. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, a lot of people that follow us, they follow us on YouTube and they they, you know, they assume that 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 we've always had a good following and that we were always like great in front of the camera and that we were always where we were at. And the fact of the matter is that for like 6 or 7 years we had zero following on YouTube, but we were still putting videos out there, still talking to the little bit of the people that were following us because it was a passion project. First time that we became partners and we got a check every month and the check from YouTube was $15 a month and we're putting hours upon hours upon hours of work into the videos that we're putting out there. That's not worth it. So if we were doing it for the money... We would have quit for sure. We would have quit. Showing art in of itself was losing us money in the beginning. I remember so many countless weekends where my booth fees exceeded what I sold and I was in the negatives. And had I not been really passionate about pursuing what I was pursuing, I certainly would have walked away. Absolutely. And the reason that it sounds like I'm ranting here is because I am ranting. Because we do get contacted by people that they they want to get started, they they get into it, and they're using money as a mile marker for their success, and they're not willing to go through the suck because the moment that things get a little bit scary when it comes to money, they give up, and by giving up, then they consider themselves a failure at doing it. And then what do they do? They go out, they get angry at us on YouTube and say something like, well, this is impossible. This is whatever. And then they become one of those people out there that would discourage somebody from following their dreams Mm -hmm. because it was just too hard. And really, the only reason that it was too hard was because they were using money as a measurement of success. And it is not a measurement of success. Money is exchange. That's all it is. It's a measurement of exchange, but it is definitely not a measurement of success. So we're not aiming for money. We're not aiming for fame, glory, accolades. We're not aiming for our self-worth to be hinging upon our art career. What the hell are we aiming for? And we're going to talk about that in the next section. So if X is what we're aiming for and WTF is often our equation, what variable does X represent? (laughs) (laughs) And the answer to that question is whatever you decide, like making your life a fulfilling one, doing what you want with it, expressing yourself, and that is entirely up to you. And as you say in the section, X marks the spot, that is going to change. Yeah. Uh, 
as you go. Yeah. And there's no magic formula uh, for how do you become a full-time artist. And I have a little previous experience with people wanting the quick fix. Right. Um, so I used to work for a clinical nutritionist at a health food store. And I would say about 75% of people that came into the shop were like, I want, I want to poo. I want to have a good bowel movement. Where's the pill section for that? You got, so I can poo, please just point me in that direction. Right. And oftentimes they were um, disappointed and frustrated and sometimes angry to find that there is no magic pill that makes you poo or that solves your gut issues or any number of bodily things that you might be experiencing. The closest thing that this green earth ever came up with was prunes. Right. But what, what they would find out after talking to my boss, the clinical nutritionist, is that it's a long game. If you want to poo better, it's lifestyle changes that you got to make slowly over time so you don't put yourself into shock. Uh, you need to make changes that are sustainable that you can carry on for the rest of your days. Right. You're not going to take a pill that's going to make you poo. And it's a lot like that in an art career. It is. Being an artist is a lifestyle. Like, you, there are certain things that I cover in just about every chapter in this book that you have to keep an eye on that don't necessarily correlate so much with, you know, what people would think of as an art career, but it, it, it does. It has a full effect on what is going on with you putting yourself out there in the way that you put yourself out there and the way that you identify yourself and the way that you look at yourself comparatively speaking to the way that the world might see you we know it's an inside job and i think oftentimes we know what we want to do or we know what we need to do we know what the next step is and we're just afraid yeah well and we're really hoping that someone will be like oh actually there is a pill for that yeah. or there is a magic answer for that but we know you just have to take that next step. Yeah, it definitely is an inside job. Whether or not you want to be an artist or you want to poo. It's it, all an it's inside all job. It's all an inside job, yes. <laughs> yeah, it matters what you're putting out there, whether it's physical exercise or joy and artwork. Yeah, exactly. One of the, the main tenant that is in this book is you're an artist, create art, put your stuff out there, persist through the suck. Push one out when times get slow. <laughs> <laughs> yes there you go guys that's your magic pill this entire commentary has just devolved into something else an art career is like a good ball movement yes <laughs> and you want that to continue for the rest of your life exactly so the final section in the book is how to get noticed and it talks about the fallacy is fallacy the correct word of the overnight success? Oh, yeah. And how, you know, people be like, but I tried this for a month or I did the one show <laughs> or as a family member of mine loved to throw in my face. I tried your way of thinking and it didn't work. My yeah. washing machine still went out on me. And how long did you try that for? Three whole days. Yeah. And some pushback happened and it was I fold in a lot of those cases. And, the, and that's that's the persist through the suck. Through the suck, yeah. Uh, our families and friends and peers did not give a rip about what we were doing for the first half of our career. Yeah. In fact, they thought we were crazy and who knows what they said when we weren't around to for each even, other. For even longer than the first half of our career, I would say that for about six years, our friends and family totally ignored us. And then during year seven, when... Uh, perfect strangers started following us online and we're like oh th you know these these the, your artwork's kind of cool then at that point then they were like huh well maybe there's something there you perhaps know? it is good and not the insane musings of two crazy people yeah th then at that point so like I, I know that a lot of people get disappointed because like their friends and family aren't as supportive as they would like them to be the truth of the matter is that like if if you don't care and you just keep putting your stuff out there and eventually uh, other people start to notice it. Like your folks, like, you know, your kind of peeps mm -hmm. start to notice it and they start following you. And then all of a sudden your friends and family notice that other people are noticing you. That's when they come out of the woodwork and are like, I, I always knew 
that you would be successful. I always knew that you'd be able to make your dreams a reality. Absolutely. And you reference comedians in this final section because they are some of the bravest uh, creators oh, I that love, you can reference. love comedians. I love comedians as a reference for putting your stuff out there because comedians go out to clubs and when they're when they're trying out a new skit, like they can't try out a new skit and see if it's funny just from home. Right, because you need that feedback from your audience. Exactly. And you need immediate feedback. And so they'll go out and do these clubs and bomb horribly, get off stage, and then an hour later go up and do the same set in front of a different group. And sometimes even some of the same people that already booed them off stage the first time. And do the set as they tweak it and tweak it and tweak it until it's something that they are they know is solid. And that's such a beautiful thing. It's real live, real time in front of the critics, R&D. Yeah. It's minor tweaks and adjustments. It's scrapping something that doesn't work. It's pivoting and going in a different direction for the whole world to see and criticize. Exactly. And that's why I think it's important to put your stuff out there. And a lot of people, that is scary. A lot of people don't want to get out in front of other people and risk getting something wrong or making a mistake or saying something wrong or whatever it is. And what they don't understand is that when they don't put the, their stuff out there and they're waiting for things to be perfect, perfect is not going to come from the bubble that they're in. Right. The only way that they're going to figure out exactly how to make this a career that really is their own career, them blazing their trail, is to put themselves out there and to make the mistakes and to learn some things the hard way and some things the easy way. And, and to get back on stage if you get booed off stage. Exactly, exactly. Because the most powerful thing that I learned uh, from us putting our stuff out there is getting back on my feet after a bad rejection, after a failed attempt at something, after something didn't work out. It was me willing to get back out there, back on the horse, Mm -hmm. and put myself out there again, uh, even though I had just bombed. And you do that for long enough, and little by little, as a trickle, your people find you. Yeah. And that's how you grow a following. I love the reference of like the secret place where collectors <laughs> hang out. Well, they all meet under this bridge at precisely this time. And I always picture that idea as like, you know, the claw game. Yeah. Uh, it's like all the collectors are in this like acrylic box and you've got this giant claw and you're like, you, you, you look like an important collector. And then you, you're trying to like grab them. And then you're like, drats, I got the one I wasn't going for. And then the claw <laughs> let go and I lost him. I could have had him. It's not like that. And I wrote down what it is like that you put and I thought it was so beautiful. Be good. Love what you do. Be real. Keep improving. Keep showing up and putting stuff out there even when everyone else says you should quit and eventually your people will find you. Yeah. Simple, long, long game, slow burn. It is. It is the long game. It is a lifestyle. It is not just, I'm going to do this thing real quick and make some, some money. I've seen artists that uh, jump in, they do something that is popular, very niche, and then they sell a whole bunch of them. There are all kinds of artists out there. And the thing is that like one thing I did not want to do is criticize anybody for any of the decisions or choices that they make in their career. It is important to understand that whether or not you create niche art because that's what you want to do, or uh, you decide that you're going to do all kinds of different multimedia stuff because that's what you want to do. Whatever it is that you want to do, do that and put it out there. And keep doing it, even if it takes a long time to gain traction. Yeah, even if you're surrounded by everyone telling you that you are nuts for doing this, you should just give up, you should just quit. If your own brain is telling you you should just give up, you should just quit. Don't listen to them. Don't listen to the naysayers, even when it's your own brain jar. Just keep going. Most definitely. So in our art career, we have things that have now gained traction. We're doing our things. We have harebrained projects that... Uh, have been years in the making. Yeah. Uh, we have something called the Boogeyman Boogie that just has not found its legs yet. But we keep at it. 
financially it makes no sense. There's no rhyme or reason for us to be pursuing this harebrained project, but simply the love for it. Yeah, exactly. If anything, a lot of our harebrained projects cost us money for a long time. And then some of them eventually will make us a little bit of money. But really, it's all about the love of just creating something and putting it out there. Uh, Creating something that you really, really want to create and putting it out there and just putting it out there and having fun. That's, That's the most important thing. This is such a childlike career to create things, to put them out there, to not be somewhere just crunching numbers and doing all these serious things. Like we are in a studio listening to music, uh, working on paintings, working on jewelry, writing our own music, recording YouTube videos, having fun as much as we possibly can and not concerning ourselves with the money. And for the people that are like, well, that's easy for you to say you're making money. Well, no, we weren't. And not for, always. For six years. And we won't always make money. There's a lot of projects that I know that maybe they're uh, doing pretty successful now, but they could drop off. There have been series of months where things just dried up for mm-hmm. no apparent reason. And then things spiked up. And it's just there's no security in it. And if we were guided by just the money, if we were guided by just the fame, if we were guided by just doing things because we thought that financially they were responsible, we'd be riding a roller coaster of emotions and being drawn in all kinds of directions that we didn't want to get drawn to. So in order to keep it authentic, just create stuff, put it out there, persist through the suck, ignore the naysayers and have fun doing what you love doing and let the love be the motivator and the end goal if you will exactly if you can end your day feeling satisfied excited and had a good time then that's a successful day yeah at that point anybody that comes up to you and is a naysayer you could say you know what i love what i do and that for me is the end goal i love what i do I love what I do. I'm going to keep on doing it. This is my life. Is that it? That's it. That's the book? I think that's a great note to end on. Oh, my goodness. That's the book. That's the book commentary. Well, this this is the book commentary for the Rogue Artist Survival Guide. Thank you, everybody that listened to this uh, ramble and craziness that uh, Clee and I did. We absolutely enjoyed putting this together for you guys. Yeah, we had a lot of fun going off on these tangents and side stories and other random things that we threw at you. And uh, we do hope that you enjoyed spending this time with us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So go out there and conquer your fears and blaze your own trail, you rogue artists, because you are all freaking awesome. And again, thank you for listening. You have reached the end of the Rogue Artist Survival Guide Expanded Commentary by Rafi and Klee. Adios!